My name is Leslie Dean. I'm 26 years old. <laughs> Today is January 27th, 2013. We're in Santa Fe, with New Mexico, and I'm here with Andrea. I'm Andrea Bacigalupa. Uh, nickname is Drew, which came from Andrea or Andrew. I'm 89 years old. Today is January the 27th, 2013. We're in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Great. So, Andrea, how long have you lived in Santa Fe? I've lived here since 1954. My wife and I moved here from Greenwich Village, New York. Mm -hmm. And were you? are you from originally from Greenwich Village? No, I, I was born in Baltimore. But then I spent... A lot of my time in New York, both as a child, my father was a railroad man, and both as a, a young boy and as a teenager, I've always loved New York. Mm -hmm. so, and we were married in New York, and then we moved out here. Mm -hmm. So what was your childhood like? Oh, I'm a child of the Great Depression. So it was not a nice childhood, particularly. It was pretty harsh. Um, and I'm a child of the streets. Uh, I knew the East Coast cities. I think maybe I didn't, didn't see much of the country until I was an adult. Well, I would see it from the train. My father being a railroad man, we rode trains a lot. It was free. I could travel a lot, even though it was a depression. As a child, I, and as a young boy, I could travel a lot. Did you like traveling? I love it. Still love it. <laughs> and as a child, do you remember going anywhere that stood out to you in particular? Well, living, uh, living in Baltimore was easy to go to Washington. So I knew Washington very well. And then because the family had railroad passes... Once I discovered New York, that my mother would take us to New York on day trips, um, I asked if I could keep my own pass and go when I wanted. And I went frequently, often hooking school to spend the day in New York. <laughs> Did you ever get in trouble? Not really. I was a good student. I knew my grades were good. I knew... And did you like school? Not particularly. Uh, as a youngster, schools weren't challenging enough for me. I could I could get straight A's with little effort, and uh, and that cost me because I remember my parents would say that my sisters had to work so hard for their grades. You don't. So were you? Where were you in the birth order of your siblings? Second. Mm -hmm. And how many siblings did you have? I had three sisters, but then my mother was very good at taking in needy relatives and stuff. And there were two boys whose my aunt had died uh, at a very early age. She took in their two sons, so they were like brothers to me. But actually, we ended up being six. Wow, and what was your mother like? A very wise woman. She wasn't educated, uh, formally educated, but extremely intelligent. She had quit school. It's hard to believe that generation. She had quit school at nine years old when her mother died to take care of her father and an older brother and a sister. Wow. And then did she, would, did she work when you were growing up or was she just? No, she was just a housewife, but uh, an extremely, extremely intelligent woman. Uh, and th that, that has always made me feel that intelligence doesn't mean you have to have a, a long list of degrees. Mm -hmm. And what were your parents' names? Her name was Maria Lara, and my father was an Andrew. 
uh, they didn't use Italian names. They didn't use the surname, this Bacigalupa that I'm giving you. Uh, there was prejudice in those days. And the Pennsylvania Railroad, my father's employers, said to him, you can't use that name. And so they changed, they didn't change it legally, but they used the name Bass instead of Bacigalupa. Even I didn't know how to pronounce it. Uh, and uh, nobody even tried to pronounce it. In school, they just would call me Andrea or Andrew. They didn't use a, and Andrea. Uh, but anyway, and many years later, I did graduate work in Italy. And when I got to Italy and discovered that culture, I thought, I want my heritage back. <laughs> and so I had even my, uh, my records of, of Andrew, because I had been Christianed Andrea. I had even my records, which were marked Andrew, changed back to my christening name, and then began to use my last name exclusively. It had never been changed legally. And how old were you at that point when you? Well, when I, when I did my graduate work in Italy, I was maybe 26. But it took that long for me to discover who and what I am, because it all been, it had all been denied. I was we're fourth I'm fourth generation Italian American. My parents weren't born in Italy, neither were my grandparents. Uh, yeah, my grandparents were some of them, not all of them. Uh, so the whole heritage was lost, and when I was living in Florence, Italy, studying art and seeing that culture, I thought, I want it back. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've gone back to Italy ever since. That was in 1950 that I was studying. Mm -hmm. And do you remember, did you ever feel discrimination growing up? Yes, there was a lot of prejudice. Um, See, I was born in 1923, and I was a child in the 30s. And I remember my parents weren't allowed to buy the home that they wanted. When they wanted to buy a home, Italian descent people weren't allowed in that neighborhood. You know, it was like they had a ban on certain ethnic groups, Jews particularly. There was a gentleman's agreement about Jews that they weren't allowed into certain clubs and neighborhoods. <clears throat> but this was also true when my parents tried to buy a home in the neighborhood that they wanted. And I remember my mother weeping about it. But, but it was a time when people didn't, didn't, didn't weep long. It was like, OK, that's that, move on. And then they found a, another home somewhere. And where, where was this? Where were they living? At this was in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And what about in school? Did you feel there was prejudice there? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just against me. It was. I remember, I was very young when I decided I'm not going to use the terms that I hear in school. Everybody had a something applied to their name, a terrible you know, ethnic words. You could be Carlos the Spick. You could be Abe the Jew. In my case, you could be Andrew the Wop. And every, they, everybody, it was German. German, if a boy was named German, he was the Kraut. If you had a French name, you were the Frog. And I remember once I was very young, telling my mother, I'm not talking like this anymore. How did you know that that was? You felt it was wrong. Well, I was a very sensitive child. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of these crazy artists, I guess. But I was very sensitive. 
So what, what did you think that your life would be like when you were younger, when you got older? I thought I would change it, and I have. Change it how so? That <clears throat> I'm going to do something with my life that uh, I'm not going to be, you know, because we were poor, I'm not going to be a laborer. I'm not going to be a kid hanging on the corner. Um, I want, and I loved the arts, and I loved reading, and I loved literature. So all of that was enriching me and making me want to be something. And then I was drawing from the time I was a preschooler and inventing stories from the time I was a preschooler. So I knew I wanted to be in the arts. I, and I believed everybody knew what they wanted. I, I thought that was normal. And I thought, but I, and you're never the success you, you dream that you're gonna be. But I've done well, I've done what I consider well. So after high school, what did, what did you do? The Army. Mm -hmm. I got out of high school the year, yeah, it was the year that war was declared, that the United States entered the war. I got out of high school in 1941, mm -hmm. and the war in Europe had been declared in 39. Mm -hmm. So I knew there was no, uh, there was no way I could get to college. The, my parents couldn't have afforded it. And I knew that I was going to be in the war. We all knew it. I mean, Roosevelt had said, and we all grew up with that, uh, this generation has a rendezvous with destiny. And all young men felt that, we're going to war. And uh, when I got out of high school, I knew that was it. But I, and I went into war work for a while to earn enough money because I worked in a shipyard and they called it shiver money. There was a lot of accidents, even fatalities in that shipyard. But the pay was good. And I thought, if I'm going to die for this country, I want to see it first. So I earned enough money to make a trip all around the United States on a Greyhound bus and see the country be before I went into the Army. Then it was the Army. Mm -hmm. And did you want to talk about that at all? Where were you, where were you, where'd you go? Europe. Um, I was served in uh, England, France, Belgium, and Germany. Mm -hmm. And the campaigns, uh, that, kind of, that part of the army is kind of ridiculous. Who gets awarded for campaigns and this and that. But the outfit I was in and, and the, uh, things that I did in the war. The campaigns that I've been credited with are uh, helping in the liberation of France. In fact, only this past year, I got a medal from France for the part, not my help, my organization, the outfit I was in. All of us were recognized as helping in the liberation of France. And then I also served in the Bulge and in the Central Europe, which was Germany. Mm -hmm. What did you think when you got that medal? I thought it's like a lot of things. An awful lot of things come very late in life. <laughs> and I thought, I never knew that France was going to recognize us. So, yeah, it was just this past year. And how long were you were you in the service? Three years. Mm -hmm. And the best thing that came out of it, because war is terrible, but the best thing that came out of it was I was able to get the education that I wanted, the GI Bill.
I did my undergraduate work at the uh, Maryland Institute of Fine Arts. And then once I had graduated from there, the Veterans Administration called me one day and they said, you know, you're entitled to uh, more education if you want it. Which I, what really came as a surprise because the whole time I was in the Maryland Institute, four years there, I did summer schools also under the GI Bill like the Art Students League in New York. I would go to their summer school, things like that. But anyway, when they told me you have uh, more entitlement, do you want it? And I was like all veterans. When veterans come back from war, particularly in this country, where and at that time, the Americans hadn't seen war. They were the home front. And I was more comfortable with Europeans at, at that point in my life. Those civilians had seen war like we had. Then I come home and you're like a fish out of water. And then these, at that time, people didn't want to hear your experiences. They didn't want to know anything about the war. It's time to move on. I was very uncomfortable. So when the Veterans Administration said, do you want more education? I said, can you send me back to France? I had served in France, not Italy. I had served in France. I was speaking French. I'd had French in high school. And over there, I got really good at it. My colonel was using me as an interpreter in France. And, and then I knew Belgian people I spoke with every day. And I, I loved France. And I said, can you send me to school in France? They got back to me and said, no, we can't send you to France. We could put you in Italy. It came as a total surprise, and I didn't want to go. I Why knew, not? I knew nothing about Italy. I'd never had the culture. I hadn't been there. I hadn't served. I didn't speak the language. I spoke French. So I reluctantly agreed. <laughs> Okay, I'll go to Florence the minute I got there, even though it was post-war Italy. And they called it Tempo della Miseria, the time of misery, because it was pretty, pretty bad. Even in 1950, five years after the war had ended, it was pretty bad. But the minute I saw it, I, I knew this is who I am. And I still feel that way. I'm, I'm more myself in Italy than I am here in the United States now. Why do you think that is? It has something to do with the people I've met. Of course, it's a beautiful country, and it's full of art, which makes me love it. But I'm sure people are the same everywhere, and there's got to be a lot of bad people in Italy the way they are everywhere else. But all I've met is very good people. So I have dearest friends. And what were you doing there? Studying art. <laughs> that's that's all, all I've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, and how long did you stay? I lived for about a year in Florence and would never have come home, except I had to. Uh, at that time, Foreigners couldn't accept work in Italy. They didn't have work for their own people. And so I couldn't have earned money. And I had to come home to earn money. But I didn't want to leave. So what was it like when you came back? Well, I, I came back to New York. And I, I, I loved New York. So it, it wasn't too bad. And by that time, I had met the girl I was going to marry. And she was living in the New York area. And how'd you meet her? In art school. <laughs> we, uh, she was from Bronxville, New York. And one summer, when I was still an undergraduate in Maryland, I went to the Art Students League in Woodstock, New York, uh, for summer courses. And Ellen was going to school there, too, that summer. And that's how we met. <laughs> Nothing but art, the whole life. <laughs> and when you met her, did you think you might marry her? I knew it pretty quickly, yeah. Um, uh, I, 
remember thinking, maybe this is going to happen. But it didn't happen immediately, because I met her in 49. And then in 1950, I went to Europe for postgraduate work. We were married in 52. And when did you decide to get married? I guess, I guess we really didn't make the decision until 1952, because we were, we were moving around a lot. When I came back from, from Europe, I lived in California for nearly a year, and Ellen was in New York. And then she came to New Mexico and lived here for a while. And we were just going across country. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But she had studied in Greece, uh, doing some graduate work. So there too, you know. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when you got married, or what were where were you, where did you live when you got married? Greenwich Village. Uh -huh. <laughs> and what were you doing at the time? Well, I I've all, I had to have work, of course. Uh, I was I had a portfolio. And I went around to galleries trying to get representation. But it was like art markets usually are. They still are the, today. You would have uh, directors of galleries tell you, we like your work, but that's not what's selling today. Can you do this? Can you, can you paint this way? Can you sculpt this way? Can you? And I was never up to those compromises. So I just took. Uh, other employment. I worked for a marine insurance agency, but did art on the side while we were living in New York. And what kind of art were, y were you doing? I was experimenting that I hadn't found myself, I'm sure, because um, most of my training had been classical working in portraiture, figure, figurative uh, painting and all that kind of stuff, and sculpture. But I was also experimenting with the modern. And sometimes there was a teacher at the Maryland Institute who, who kind of goaded me into doing abstractions. Uh, and I got fairly good at that. And I was also doing expressionistic stuff. I was trying to find my way. Uh, and I was. I was developing um, which ended up being my the strength in all my work. I was developing uh, good lines, good linear work. And uh, I think it's, it's what the Europeans recognize in my work. Sometimes here in, in the States, I feel like critics still don't understand my work. But uh, in Europe, Whenever I've shown work over there, there's always been comments on the form and the line. Mm -hmm. Was there a moment when you felt like you had found yourself artistically? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're never free of doubts, I don't think, in any of the arts. I mean, when I hear professional actors talk about stage fright, it's perfectly understandable. Everything, everything seems so hard when you take it on. Uh, but you know, you know what you're good at. And what was that moment for you when you found yours? I'm not sure that I, I could p put it down to a moment. Uh, I know, you know, we have five children. And I know as the children grow older, some of them would begin to tell me that they loved my drawings, which were primarily line. So I was, I was hearing what I knew was being reinforced th through many years about the lines and the forms. You know, when I do sculpture, like here in Santa Fe in front of City Hall, uh, there's a, I have a public work, a statue of St. Francis and the Prairie Dog. And a lot of people look at that and they think it's representational because it's obviously St. Francis and what they call a prairie dog. I always thought of it as a critter. 
but it's known locally as St. Francis and the Prairie Dog. And people think it's totally representational. I know that it, there are abstract shapes in those figures. I know it's all form and line and not representational. Mm -hmm. um, does it matter to you how people interpret it? No, no. In fact, I've been very pleased with the reception of that. People think it's representational, uh, but the public, it's been down there since 1980, but the way the public has accepted it, you know, when it first went up, it was one of, I, maybe it was my first public work, or among the first, and I thought, it's in a public place, it's gonna be vandalized. Instead of being vandalized, the public does wonderful things with it. For instance, last Christmas, not this past Christmas, the year before, that little critter, that little prairie dog, somebody had made a beautiful little red coat for it with fur trim on it and covered up the prairie dog with his cloak. And one another Christmas, Francis was wearing a Santa Claus hat. So I know the public is enjoying it. And in fact, I had to pass it today because I parked a block away and walked here. And I stopped to look at it, and I could see that the so-called prairie dog, people keep touching the head because when you touch bronze, you make it shiny. And his head is, is getting a shine where people are touching it. So I've been extremely pleased with the reception of it. Are there any other works that stand out to you that you've done? You mean public works? Just anything. There are public works. I have etched glass in the cathedral here, St. Francis Cathedral. But most of my public work is, is out of state <clears throat> because for years I worked with uh, architects and uh, they would, I worked with one who was so good. We weren't prima donnas. I respected what he did, he respected what I did. But he would tell me, I'm gonna do the structural elements of the building, mostly churches, but the interiors are yours. You design the interiors. And I could, I could go wild. I could design sculpture, sculptural walls and all that kind of stuff, and a lot of stained glass for churches. Uh, and I have a lot of that work. I did. For quite a few years, I, and particularly in, in Texas, a lot of work like that in Texas, mm -hmm. some in Colorado. And when uh, I have a public, public one in Sorrento, Italy, uh, public bronze in front of a pontifical basilica. Mm -hmm. And it ha what is that like for you to have that there? Wonderful, because there again, the people love it. Uh, it's it's uh, not a huge statue. She's not life size. It's a little Madonna, uh, and she's about three feet tall, standing on a like a, a stand that's maybe table tabletop size, so the people can touch her. And it's in a little square where they go for coffee after church, a little coffee shop, and people congregate. And every time I've gone to see it, it's always being touched. It's always got flowers around it. Sometimes I've had to move the flowers so you can see a statue. <laughs> so, you know, there's great satisfaction and things like that. Mm -hmm. And where does your inspiration come from? It's a mystery. I'm, I have no idea. But I've been, it, I think it, the germ could have been with my mother. She was a great storyteller. And listening to, to her stories, I would be sitting, even as a very young child, I'd be sitting in, in her kitchen drawing instead of being outdoors playing. Um, 
And while she was working in the kitchen, she'd tell me stories about her family, about her friends. She had a, a very fine knowledge of the human condition. She talked a lot about people and their behaviors. And I was writing stories at that time, which the writer evolved into books. Um, so some of it had to have started with her. And she also talked about her father, who had died when I was nine, when I was five years old. I didn't know him too well, but I have sharp memories of him because he was such a gracious, wonderful little man. And also, and the arts could have started with him. He wasn't an artist, but he would take me into to get me away from the domestic scene at night. <laughs> he would take me into a living room and close the door and sit me on his lap. And he'd have a glass of wine, but he was playing Caruso records. So even under five, I was exposed to old Victrolas playing Caruso records. So it must have all started there. Mm -hmm. And when did you find out that you were going to be a father? I married fairly late, you know, uh, the Army and then all those years of school. Late for my generation. It isn't late these days. But I was 29 when I married, and I was 30 when our first child was born in New York. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was wonderful. I, I know many artists who think families are a burden and a hindrance to your profession. I love family. Um, I wanted it all. <laughs> um, and so what, how did being a father change you? Well, it changes. It's inevitable when you, when, for one thing, you're, You've got to be less selfish the minute there's children in your lives. And yet, it, 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 there are times now when you think, like, yes, I could have been a better parent, given them more time. But in a way, we gave our children a lot of, a lot of freedom and a lot of time. Because I can remember I'd be working in my studio, painting or sculpting or... I also did ceramics. The children were always around, and they didn't bother me at all. And we had five. And they were like underfoot. And you'd give them paper and say, draw, or, you know, you'd give them clay and say, make, make something. So we didn't give them, I don't think, what conventional parents give their children. We gave them something probably valuable. Uh, we went on a lot of trips. We took them, we took five children to Italy one summer when my wife and I had a, re a reason to go over there to see partners we were working with. We took five children fr from age 16 down to two months. And at those days you didn't go on planes, you went on ships. And, you know, we were two weeks on the ship to get there and all that kind of thing, which means these children had wonderful experiences. But they they didn't maybe get the conventional bringing up. <laughs> and how do you think that affected them as adults? They're wonderful people. I'll buy them. And, um, and they have good lives. And, uh, so, it, you know, it's turned out well. <laughs> I 
And what are their names? They have very unusual names uh, because they're, again, the fact that Ellen and I loved Europe and loved different cultures. And she, Ellen's not, a, she doesn't have my ethnic background. Ellen is uh, Welsh, English. She was a Williams marrying a Bacigalupa. <laughs> and since she, she was an artist, I thought maybe she'd want to keep the name Williams. And she said, no, that's, I like Bacigalupa. Uh, but anyway, the children's names, one of them, the first one, John Andrea, a boy. A girl, Pier Francesca. Another boy, Rohan Sayre. Another girl, Chiara Domenica. And another girl, Daria Concessa. And what we found through the years is they like those names. Did they always like the names? I don't know that they always like them. I, I think they may have found, particularly like the first one, his John Andrea. The John is not J-O-H-N. It's the Italian, G-I-A-N. He may have found that a little bit difficult early in life, but I'm sure he likes it now. And then Chiara... The fourth child, that's a very unusual name in this country. But in Italy, if you go to Assisi, they never heard of Francis and Claire. It's Francesco, of course, for Francis, but Claire is Chiara. And we liked the name, and we gave it Chiara her name. Why, she absolutely loves it. Um, so what what's life like now for you? Uh, I went to Europe. Uh, it'll be two years in this coming May. In a few months, it'll be two years. And it was like, do I dare do this? Because it was after I was, you know, I'm the heart surgery. You never quite recover fully from it. Do I dare travel alone, and do I dare do stairs, and do I dare do the long walks that one has to do in Europe? But I went for the ordination of John Paul, not the ordination, the beatification of John Paul II, because I had had personal blessings from him twice in my life, and it's very extraordinary to meet him to encounter him was a very extraordinary thing. He was like, like no other person you can imagine. So, you know, have, having met him twice, I wanted to go for that beatification. And when I went, I was, I did well in Italy. I was able to, at that altitude, see that sea level, here is 7,000 feet. I don't know whether you felt the altitude mm -hmm. here, but, but after heart surgery, I felt it a lot. So over there at sea level, I did extremely well. And what was the beatification like? I think more than the beatification, because I, I was very pleased that he was beatified, but I think more than the just the service itself. I was impressed with, with Rome, what was going on in Rome. People from all over the world had come there for that beatification. because I had had 
personal blessings from him twice in my life. And it's very extraordinary to meet him. To encounter him was a very extraordinary thing. He was like, like no other person you can imagine.